the great American desert, arid, inhospitable. Certainly not the first place a person would think to build a farm. Unless he had a dream in mind and the heart of a pioneer. My father first came out here before Arizona was even a state. And there was nothing here but cactus. But then they put the dam up and we dug the irrigation, my father and I. And I guess you could say we made the desert bloom. It wasn't easy, especially for my father, and it isn't easy now. Every morning we're up, my boys and I, planning the day out, depending on what has to be done. Good morning. We better cut this field just like we did that south. But one thing I do know, Leave the border out. farming has yeah. changed a lot since I was my son's yeah, age. And we've changed with it. You've got to. Got to keep up with the latest technology. Yeah, we water it once right after we get down here and then let the sheep in. They'll take care of it all, though, in good shape. Innovation is a key word in this business. Half the tools and equipment I use today didn't even exist five years ago. My father wouldn't recognize the farm today. I probably wouldn't recognize my son's farm in the future. But I guess if we were afraid of change, we'd never have come out here in the first place. The pioneering spirit of individual farm families rises with the sun each and every morning throughout these United States. In the cold of northern winters, in the summer heat of the Midwest, in the South and in the Far West, the American farmer begins his day facing hard work and uncertainties. Uncertainties of weather, of markets, of land. Let us celebrate that spirit, for that spirit has made a miracle. early on the farms and ranches of America, and for good reason. There's a lot to do on a busy farm or ranch today. America's food producers produce food better than any other farmer anywhere else in the world, and he works at it. Works at it long and hard. And a lot of people say, how can the American farmer produce as much as he does? And we get delegations from the Soviet Union and from the Eastern European bloc and from developing countries. And they come over here and they take a look at our technology. They look at our equipment, at our breeding stock, at our chemicals, our tools of technology. Take it all back to their homeland with them. But they miss the one most important ingredient. And that is the freedom of initiative that we have in America. That's the freedom that we have to produce and to innovate and to come up with new ideas and to try them. I spent some time in the People's Republic of China recently. And as I walked through China, a nation of 850 million people, a billion by 1985, that's a fourth of the world's population. I realized it was taking 80% of that population to feed the population on a subsistence level. And I wondered why, because then you take a look at what I call the world's most important minority. The 4% of 230 million people in the United States who produce food and feed all of us better than we deserve to be fed, and feed a lot of other hungry people around the world. And the question comes back, why? Why are we able to do what we do so well? Well, I have an answer. The answer is freedom. And it's a story that begins with the American dream itself with those first settlers who traveled to the New World in search of liberty, a better life, and the pursuit of individual happiness. These pilgrim farmers quickly found that old world methods simply did not work. But through innovation and hard work, they transformed rustic settlements into thriving cities. They transformed the countryside because they had the incentive to do so and the personal freedom to succeed. In the new world, a man's land was his own, and the fruits of that land were his to dispose. 
These first American pioneers banded together to ensure that this unique joining of individual liberty and free enterprise would endure. America, of course, did not come easy. Progress, like freedom, requires sacrifice. From the beginning, farmers made the sacrifice. We recall the patriotism of the Minuteman, but few remember that he was standing next to a plow, or that some of our country's most illustrious patriots were farmers. Farmers have always shaped the land. They turned the original 13 colonies into states, and the 13 states into a nation. When America moved westward, it was the farmer who tamed the land through spirit and through innovation. It was his desire to succeed that conquered the wilderness. Up north, he planted wheat and corn. And down south, thanks to Eli Whitney, cotton became king. But as America's population continued to grow, so too did the demand on farmers. Crops were still harvested, much as they'd always been, by hand. But in 1831, all that changed when Cyrus Hall McCormick first demonstrated the horse-drawn reaper. Farmers entered the age of mechanization, and innovations came at a faster and faster rate, as labor-saving machinery of all sorts made farms ever more productive. Railroads were built to bring a farmer's crops to market. New plows cut open the western plains. Windmills brought water to arid lands. And the teams of 40 or more horses that once pulled grain binders were replaced by the steam engine. And still the innovations continued. With hybrid crops to improve yield, with better methods of cultivation. And steam engines gave way to the single most versatile tool a farmer owns, the gasoline-powered tractor. With the tractor came a whole new generation of tools and an industry to sell and service them. American farmers were on their way to the 20th century. Today, the American farmer is the envy of all nations, and his pioneering spirit is still propelling him towards greater and greater innovations. And what about the future as far as how we farm? Well, on land-grant college campuses across the nation, and research farms and commercial research work. We're finding new ways to farm that even in our wildest dreams we probably can't imagine right now. Ten years from now, we could be producing food totally different. Let's take a look at some ideas that may change the way you produce food. Marketing channels is an opportunity for us to make significant gains in agricultural marketing. This is a classroom at Arizona State University. And here, farmers of the future are studying the business of agriculture. As the marketing and distribution of food products becomes increasingly complex, we will see the emergence of a new breed of farmer businessman, as well-versed in marketing, financial analysis, and advertising as he is in the management of livestock and crops. Here is Dr. Richard Chalquist, Dean of the College of Agriculture, Arizona State University. One of the factors of management and one of the factors that we're trying to include in our classroom here is trying to make people like Drucker and Gellerman as common to the agricultural graduate as they are to other people in the industry. We have passed the era where you can do the things with your own two hands. We're now in the era where you must be able to accomplish things through the hands of others. Farmer of the future must have a broader education than he had in the past. He's going to have to have a global outlook on things. He's going to have to be worried about things like the cotton crop in Egypt, the soybean crop in Brazil, 
and the demand for beef in Japan. Those factors are going to very much be involved in the future of agriculture. He's going to have to have an education to match those kind of needs. The students who have uh, backgrounds that can include uh, management skills, computer skills, along with the knowledge of agriculture, are going to be very much in demand. Another interesting thing about the farmer of the future is that a good many of them will never have lived on a farm until they begin to run one, as faculty chairman Phil Stiles points out. Most of our students really are from the city. I'd say well over 50% are from an urban area. They have little or no farm background. They have this intense interest in working with agriculture in the field, working with animals, with commodities, but working with it as a business manager. I see the future of agriculture becoming bigger farms, but particularly more capital intensive. This means that farms are going to look at their business as a management investment enterprise. They're going to look at how much money is invested in this business and expect a return on the money in addition to better yields on their crops and their animals. The farmer of the future obviously has to be a business person. Uh, he or she must uh, be able to manage money, be able to manage people, <coughs> and be able to put all these tools together in a, in a very efficient manner. Sunshine, energy from the sun, it is the fuel of life itself, but only plants are able to feed directly from the sun. All the animals of Earth, including man, must therefore have access to plants somewhere in their food chain if they are to survive. So the question of how to increase plant or crop yields is central to the work of many agricultural research scientists. Dr. Jack Mooney, plant physiologist, is one of them. Mankind, uh, since the beginning of time, has been attempting to uh, increase the productivity of his plants that he uses for growing food and fiber. And in early years, of course, this was done by uh, increasing the fertility of the land or um, plowing or uh, keeping weeds out of the fields. But um, in more recent times, uh, increases in productivity have become more difficult. And we have been on what scientists called a yield plateau uh, for some 10 years now. Uh, this is uh, because in order to get increases, we have exhausted all of the more obvious things to do. And in order to get the yield increase, we have to go to a better understanding of the plant and the way it goes about uh, producing the crop in order to achieve increases in yield. In laboratories across the country, scientists are working to overcome the yield plateau, directing their investigations to the innermost workings of plants to see what makes them tick. As a result, some dramatic breakthroughs in crop productivity lie on the immediate horizon. For example, the studies of Jack Mooney and his associates at the Western Cotton Research Laboratory have demonstrated that increasing the photosynthetic capabilities of the cotton plant, a mere 15%, can generate an increased cotton yield of over 50%. Okay, uh, Jim and Jan, let's pour this sugar water. Like farmers, the work of an agricultural scientist doesn't necessarily end when the sun goes down. This may look like a scene from some sort of monster movie. However, in this case, the monster being pursued is a very real one, the bullworm, an insect responsible for the devastation of crops throughout the sun belt. These researchers are working on new techniques for controlling the bullworm and other insect pests without the use of insecticide, as entomologist Pete Lindgren explains. We as uh, entomologists uh, study insect behavior. We study behavior because uh, we want to try and uh, determine what the insect does when it mates, when it feeds, when it lays eggs, how far it moves. And the more we know about this behavior, the better we can use our technology to try to control the insect. This is a mating table that we are looking at. Uh, on this table, we have uh, virgin females who have one set of wings clipped. Therefore, they can't fly away from the table. At a certain time of night, they secrete a pheromone that attracts the males in to mate with them. Pheromones are chemicals that are secreted by the, either the male or the female, depending on the species, that attract the opposite mate. The use of synthetically produced and biodegradable pheromones to trap insect pests may still be down the road a few years, but there's no question that any permanent solution to the insect problem will come only through a thorough understanding of insect behavior.
The innovative spirit of the pioneers is as evident in agricultural researchers as it is in farmers themselves, and it leads to the continual development of new technologies. I guess you call us a modern day cowboy, uh, riding around on our, uh, on our tricycles and uh, shooting the plants with our infrared thermometer, our gun, if you will. The particular uh, infrared thermometer that uh, we're using, the thing that we call the gun, is a prototype. Infrared thermometry has been around for many, many years, but this happens to be the first model of uh, infrared thermometer, which is easy to use and easy to read and uh, very adaptable for field use. Farmers telling whether or not their crops are healthy by taking their temperatures? Sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? So we asked Bob Reginato, a scientist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, to explain how it works. Normally, the way we would uh, use this gun would be to go out uh, shortly after noon every day and measure the crop temperature and also measure the air temperature because what we're really interested in is the difference between the crop and the air. If the crop temperature is lower than the air temperature, the crop is healthy. If it goes above the air temperature, then those are signs that the crop is beginning to be stressed. So you know, as a plant is actively growing, uh, it's using water and its leaves act as an evaporative cooler. But as moisture becomes limiting in the ground, the plants do not evaporate as much water, the leaves are not as cool, and therefore its temperature rises, indicating that it's under stress. And we can use that stress then to determine when to irrigate uh, the particular crop we're interested in. But one of the major benefits for a farmer with uh, irrigated crops is that he will be able to determine precisely when he should irrigate his crops. If he irrigates more efficiently, uh, there's a possibility that he will increase his yield. That is, he will get more pounds of crop per unit of water use. Innovation in agriculture isn't just happening in the classroom or the laboratory or at the research farm. There are some innovations affecting agriculture happening in other areas too. One of them is communications. And of course that's a pet of mine. I've been trying to make a living at communicating now for quite a few years. But the business of communicating as it involves agriculture is important. And really, I think in agricultural communications we're involved in two different areas. First of all, if you're going to be a good communicator, you have to be a good listener. And I think it's important that we in agriculture listen to what organized labor leaders have to say and what consumer leaders have to say. There's some messages there for us. And once we've been able to listen, then we can put together an effective, positive response. Because we really can't get along without each other. As a matter of fact, farmers in this country need the people who live in Chicago and Los Angeles and Philadelphia and New York. They need them for a couple of reasons. First of all, to consume the products of the farm. If you don't have somebody to buy what you're producing, pretty soon you don't have a market and you don't have a price. Secondly, you need a lot of those people in the cities of America to produce the tools that we need to produce food efficiently. And of course, on the other hand, people in the towns and cities of America simply couldn't get along without farmers. As I've said many times, if you eat, you're involved in agriculture. That doesn't leave many of us out. And so we need the farm people of America to produce the food that we enjoy. And we need to understand. Instead of the walls, we need to build bridges of understanding. And I am seeing new ways that farm people are finding to communicate with their urban neighbors. Let me list a couple of examples, and you may want to use them. Some young farmers in a Midwestern county decided that a lot of people were misled when they looked at the bottom line of the supermarket bill and said, that's our food bill. And so they stationed themselves at checkout counters in some of the supermarkets in their county. And as people came through the checkout counter, they asked if they might conduct a little test. That was simply separating the edible items from the non-edible items. And they came up with some amazing results to prove that the bottom line isn't necessarily the food bill. Matter of fact, they found one ladies' shopping cart that had 64% of the items non-edible. And yet, she readily admitted that when she got home and saw the bottom line, that would, in her mind, be her grocery bill. And then a group of wheat growers out in a western wheat producing state one, one year decided they were going to prove to the people who buy bread how much 
the wheat costs in that loaf of bread. And so they ran a campaign with the Junior Chamber of Commerce, and they said, starting next Monday, bring your empty bread wrappers into the Chamber of Commerce office, and we'll refund the value of the wheat in that loaf of bread. And people were saving wrappers and pulling them out of waste baskets. And when Monday morning rolled around, they were there, and they walked in and said, here are the wrappers. Now give us our money. And they got four cents. Four cents, the value of the wheat in that loaf of bread. These are just two examples of how America's food producers are doing a better job of communicating in a way that doesn't offend anyone. It's positive communications. And I'm running across more and more positive communicating ideas where farm people are building bridges to the city people. They say the productivity of the American farmer holds the key to many of the nation's and the world's most pressing problems. And you know, that gives me satisfaction at the end of a hard day. Farm life has been and continues to be the living embodiment of traditional American values, which includes hard work. But at the end of the day, if you're like me, you sort of reflect back on what you've done during that busy day. And maybe sometimes you say, is it all worth it? Is what I'm doing really of any value to anybody? Well, I'd like to try to answer that question for you because sometimes when you just look to the line fence, you don't get the total perspective. And having had the opportunity to travel in a lot of countries and visit with a lot of farm people, let me assure you that it is worth it. If you believe in peace in the world, then you've got to know that hungry people will fight to get food. And so if you can help feed them, you're helping that. And from the standpoint of a future for the sale of American farm products, I think it's tremendous. The country of China, for example, growing by leaps and bounds. And in China, you don't see a farmyard in a commune that's filled with equipment. You quickly realize that in China, a 10-row cultivator is 10 ladies with long-handled hoes. And so as their population grows, and as the government there realizes that they must never let starvation become a way of life in China again, then they look to people who can produce the food to keep starvation away. That's the American farmer. And that's why the market will be there. It'll continue to grow. Because nowhere on this planet do you find the land and the climate, the capital, the management, the dedication, and the innovation that you find stretching from the Appalachians to the Rockies and north into the Canadian provinces. And that's why it's worth it.